the first minute or two, the sound is a little raw, but it gets cleared up real fast. So don't worry about the initial sound quality. John Steele, on memory, KPFK Los Angeles. Okay, we have ignition. This morning, we're going to explore a vast array of stuff which has uh, come to me over the years through various channels um, with no names. <laughs> and uh, I'm really going to speak my mind. I'm going to think it out so it's not in any set form. But there is, a, there is an order I want to go through. And it will be kind of a, a look at different elements of contracted mind and extended mind so we can begin to see the juxtaposition of, of the two, how each one defines the other. The element of um, contracted mind uh, I'd like to look at first before the extended mind aspect. And for those of you who heard me last year, I'll briefly capitulate this idea of the Kali Yuga as a set piece before I launch into the specifics. The Kali Yuga is the age that we live in in terms of uh, East Indian chronology. There are four great Yugas of time. There is, um, a go roughly speaking, a golden age, a Sat Yuga, and then a Silver Age, and then a Bronze Age, and then an Iron Age, each one of varying durations. We won't get into the cosmological mathematics because they're up for grabs. Uh, allegedly, the age that we live in now is the end of a cycle. Each of these four ages is part of a cycle called a Maha Yuga. The Kali Yuga is the Dark Age, it's the Iron Age, um, it's the age of Kali. Kali is the is a goddess, goddess of dissolution of time and structures. Um, she clears the way for uh, those impediments of evolution that have arisen. Now, in the Kali Yuga, uh, what occurs is, in terms of time, very interesting because the Tibetan translation for Kali Yuga literally means the dregs of time. The dregs of time, what does that mean? It means the bottom of the barrel of time. It means that time has reached a density, a certain temporal density. And this temporal density can actually be felt somatically in the body. Now, what is the definition of temporal density? Temporal density means we have too many events per unit of time to fully assimilate in our everyday life. That means that you've got to pay the bills and take the kids out and go to the doctor and wash the clothes and put out the cat and, you know, do everything. It's an, uh, an unending array of tasks that have to be accomplished. And just when you think you've finished them all, new ones magically arise. You are never finished. Now, so the Kali Yuga has this... Um, this idea of a, a temporal density, and I want to explore that in several different ways here. Um, one of the things that occurs in, in the Kali Yuga, one other aspect, uh, which is an interesting concomitant to the temporal density, is that there is a seasonal disequilibrium. In other words, all, uh, the, the climate and the seasons go out of whack. Uh, rain doesn't fall at the right time, snow doesn't fall at the right time. There's a seasonal imbalance. This is one of the aspects in terms of the Kali Yuga, this climatic disequilibrium. And what I'm pointing to is when you get a temporal disequil, you know, temporal, den high temporal density, that there is at least a correspondence to a climatic fluctuation. And as people like Padmasambhava and, and other great teachers have said, this climatic uh, disequilibrium is part of the Kali Yuga. Now, um, one of the uh, aspects uh, in terms of, again, of Eastern thought that occurs uh, in the Kali Yuga uh, is a, um, how shall we say, is a, our time window narrows in this um, uh, kind of 
uh, density scenario. And so what happens, you, last night the Miller Lite beer uh, ad was mentioned. I will mention another beer ad which uh, may bring back some memories. Quite a few years ago in America there was a Schlitz ad, Schlitz beer of Milwaukee. And it showed these macho guys on the sailboat and the spray coming out. And it said, you only go around once in life, so grab all the gusto you can. So the idea was, since, you know, this was it, you had to have as good a time as possible right now. So the idea encapsulated in this ad is, is are many different values. First of all is the idea that there are no past lives and there are no future lives. This is it. And therefore, you've got to hedonistically explode in the moment and uh, just really grab everything possible. Now, this, the, the value inherent here is that you'll go for short-term games and to hell with anything possible long-term. So this means uh, rip off anyone, uh, have war, as long as you profit in the immediate moment. Grab all the gusto you can. Now, back to Buddhism for a moment. In the, um, one of the sutras, the La Kavantara Sutra, one of the Buddhist sutras, there is a, um, a wonderful uh, teaching and, it, and it, this is not tantric Buddhism, it's Mahayana Buddhism, but it's still the same basic set. And one of the uh, teachings in there goes as, as such, uh, for those of you who... My work is on memory, so I have this great interest in the subject. It says, when the triple world is surveyed, that's past, present, future, by the Bodhisattva, he perceives that its existence is due to memory that has been accumulated since the beginningless past but wrongly interpreted. Now, it is this concept of memory that is wrongly interpreted that I want to take a good hard look at here. And before we get into that, uh, a few more notes. Um, you know, the word memory in Sanskrit uh, comes from the word vasana, uh, V-A-S-A-N-A, and it's a beautiful word because it has several different nuances. Uh, it means a memory which is uh, transmitted from one life to another, either consciously or unconsciously, usually unconsciously. Memories, habit patterns that are generated within one life are called samskaras. That's different from a vasana. Vasanas have a cross-life uh, connection. Now, the, the, one of the, the secondary meanings of this word vasana is very appropriate to one of my other interests, and that is fragrance, because the secondary meaning of the word vasana means if you have an empty perfume bottle, even if it's completely empty, the smell always remains of that scent in that bottle. In other words, the scent pervades even when the vessel is empty. And this is what the, in the Sanskrit language, very mixture of, of great technical precision and great poetic insight, uh, you have this idea that a, a past life memory is like... Um, uh, it's like the, the smell which goes through time, the smell memory goes from one life to another, even though the bottle is empty. Now, um, in this word also means habit energy. Vasana means habit energy. And this word habit energy in Tibetan, bachak, is a, a term for it. It's like a trace, like the smell, like the trace. And the teaching in the sutra is that these traces, they build up after a while to the extent where we begin to nucleate uh, uh, an ego around them, like I get up every morning and I do this and I eat that, and you get this whole kind of uh, an axis of a moment, what the Buddhists call an axis of the moment begins to generate. This I, the subject, begins to generate from habitual action, repetitive, automatic, hypnotic, you know, action. Now, the, um, therefore, one of the ways, one of the strategies to deal with this nucleation around this moment of subjectivity is to learn how to, um, shall we say, die to oneself. And this is in the perennial philosophy and the mystical philosophies known as the tradition of unknowing, of unknowing, like the 14th century English mystic work, the cloud of unknowing. And this whole process I want to look at in a moment. I just wanted to set that out. Now, 
with the, with the idea of um, memory wrongly interpreted, we can begin to look at a bit of present time through this filter. You see, we live in an age at which we are virtually hoarding memory. Computers are based on the idea of, like, you look at women in terms of their vital measurements. Well, you look at computers in terms of their vital measurements, in terms of their memory capacities. This one has so many bits, and this one has more bits, and this one can process those bits faster and faster. The memorial capacity is really the key to the, the strength uh, of a computer. Now, the, the trouble is with this is that um, the, there is, and I'm generalizing, much of what computers do is wonderful. I'm not putting down computers per se. Uh, but there is a, an emphasis on the acquisition of memories that can be stuck into the computer. And what too many memories do after a while, uh, whether they are in a com see, because if they're in a computer, even if they're in a computer, they have to be in a programmer's mind, even in a real chunked style. They have to be some level of recursiveness in the com even in the programmer's mind. Now, how much he offloads into the computer itself, there has to be some level of memory of what's inside. So the more that's inside the computer, the more that has to be in the mind of the, com uh, of the programmer. It's a great reduction, but still, you begin to set up a great array of memories that is uh, auxiliary to what would be needed for ordinary life. Now, what begins to happen is that with this tremendous array of memory storage, and we have, you, you begin to clog a system. A system becomes constipated by actual uh, too much uh, hoarding of memory. Now, this um, hoarding of memory sets up a, a kind of a psychological density. And as the system becomes uh, clogged, it becomes brittle. That is to say, it cannot react quickly to crisis situations because it is overloaded with choices and information. There's too much information. Every time that something happens now in the modern world, the reaction time is stunted to such a point by the vast uh, array of information processing technology that people cannot react like that anymore in, in real critical decisions. Everything is so rationally uh, displayed in terms of its memorial capacity. And yet, with all this memorial capacity and all this incredible telecommunications, the, the world is coming apart at the seams. I mean, it, it's, we're balanced on, we're, as the Tibetans say, we're licking uh, honey from the razor's edge in terms of our information uh, acquisition. Uh, it's actually, and this is memory wrongly interpreted, this vast collection of memory as though more is better. That's the, the assumption that we're working under. Now, um, the more memory that you accrete, you see, paradoxically, you set yourself up more for what in systems terms we call the likelihood of a runaway system. A runaway system is a, like a snowball going down a hill, getting bigger and bigger and more progressively out of control. And the more you develop memory wrongly interpreted in terms of vast acquisition, the more likely you are to go into a runaway system. <clears throat> because your reaction time is cut, your direct perception, your direct unmediated by vast information uh, technology is cut. And um, this likelihood of a, of a runaway system occurs. And this is what happens, you see, in things like... Um, uh, this all this contrigate stuff. You have this incredible information technology. You have the NSC computers and the CIA computers and the DIA computers and all these things. And what happens is that you lose control of who's you know who's in charge. It's Ollie North is running the ball this way and Colby is running the ball this way and everyone's kind of what we call in systems theories again. You begin to generate institutions within institutions. And this happens when you get this memory wrongly interpreted to such a point where there is you, there, clarity disappears uh, of the overview. Now, what further begins to happen is um, that this memory wrongly interpreted begins to generate. There are two. This is a footnote. There are two types of unconscious mind I want to point out here. One is what I would call unconscious unconscious, and that's when you're asleep at the wheel. It's like you're dead drunk. It's like you're numbed. There's no sensation. 
Okay. That's unconscious, unconscious. Then, contrasted to that, there's conscious, unconscious. Now, the link of conscious, unconscious is really shamanic consciousness. It's where there is a bridge between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. It's what Jung would call the transcendent function. There's a bridge between these two realms. Now, most people are walking around, as all the perennial philosophies say, we're in a state of sleep. We're walking around in a state of unconscious, unconscious. It's what Gurdjieff calls, we're all asleep. We're sleepwalkers. Um, this unconscious, what, what happens then is that there's an unconscious mental mass is generated by memory wrongly interpreted. In other words, what begins to happen is, conversely to what Terence was talking about last night, the idea of a living conscious memory, what gets generated is what, what William Burroughs would call language as virus is generated. You see, this is where language goes out of control. It's just the opposite to a living language. And what is what I call an unconscious mental mass, mass proliferates in the environment. And it means that there's all these kind of invisible habit patterns and invisible kind of runaway systems linguistically on a subvocal voice in the environment. And uh, what, as, uh, what, as uh, one of my teachers uh, has said, uh, that at a certain point, habit patterns become solidified in the environment and in the body. Now, this is something that, um, and this is from the Tibetan point of view, this is something actually that uh, Norbu said, that habit patterns get solidified. And the great illustration of this in terms of, for example, in a tantric thought, is there's a great Indian Mahasiddha, Saraha, who um, was the, uh, the arrow maker. And uh, he... Uh, uh, taught the idea that um, memory it, it can exist in many states. It's like water. Water can be very fluid and that at a certain point it can become ice and become solidified. Now, that's the shift from natural mind and natural memory to memory wrongly interpreted when it solidifies. And when it, when, when it solidifies, the mind stops. It gels like that. And that's where this sensation of ego comes from this nucleation. So, um, this idea of, a, of an unconscious mental mass, as the, uh, the idea of, of virus, uh, language as virus, is something that uh, we kind of have to be aware of. Um, it's the idea that words have a, a life of their own. It's like people's minds, the, the subvocal voice, uh, it, oftentimes you think, well, I'm in charge, and the subvocal vo voice is going, I want this, I want this, I want this, what the Buddhists call monkey mind. It's like it's going here and here and here, and you are saying, I don't really think that, but something else, this, and that's this automatic mind is going off, and that's this language as virus, memory wrongly interpreted, gone organic. Now, one of the um, uh, aspects of why that there's this great accumulation uh, of memory um, is th it's the idea, the illusion is that the more memory we have, the more control and manipulation and prediction of reality we will have. If we can manage memory and keep it, you know, on tap so we can push a button, therefore we'll be able to manipulate reality better with all this memory that we've got there and the external forms of computer banks and books and, and everything else. And, um, we begin to hoard memory because we feel it will give us prediction and control and manipulation of reality. The Central Intelligence Agency, stop and think of that for a moment. Central Intelligence Agency, what does it do? It gathers information about everything in the world except the natural intelligence of the people who are in the organization. There's nothing to do with self-knowledge. Intelligence, intelligence of the other, not of self-knowledge. Um, now, the um, idea of this uh, memory wrongly interpreted brings us to um, an interesting model here. Again, in the Buddhist uh, framework, 
um, we talk about that thought or memory, as the teaching goes, as Saraha teaches in, in, in his, uh, what he calls the royal song, the Dohas. And these are kind of like poetic teachings. He teaches that memory arises from emptiness, abides in emptiness, and then dissolves back into emptiness. Or, as he teaches, memory arises from non-memory, what he calls non-memory, abides in non-memory, and then sinks back, dissolves into non-memory. Now, this cycle of arising, abiding, and dissolving is the cycle of all thought. And this cycle is also two other analogs that we can give to it. It is the basic nature of today what Prigogine calls dissipative systems. Things arise, they abide, and they dissolve. And they arise in a slightly different form, and then they abide in a slightly different form, and they dissolve. Now, dissipative systems, a, a footnote on this, is much more ancient than Prigogine. What all he's done is brought it into a contemporary mode. Uh, in the early forms uh, of my interest of archaeology, uh, we find it uh, embodied in the idea of um, the triple goddess. Uh, that is to say, the, and the, the triple goddess is exemplified by the three phases of the moon. And that is to say, there's a new moon, there's a full moon, and then there's the waning moon. And then they go back to a fourth phase, which people rarely really recognize, and that is the state where moon is not visible at all. That is really the, the true emptiness. And this dissipative cycle uh, is mirrored in the arising of thought, abiding of thought, and uh, dissolving back into. Now, well, the reason I bring this up is the following, is that in uh, the paradigm of memory, as it's looked at in the 20th century, memory is looked at primarily from the point of view of Western psychology only in one of these three phases. That is to say, it's looked at principally in the middle phase, the abiding phase. It, we do not look at where memory comes from or where it goes to. Only in a psychoanalytical sense, we look at your childhood memories and stuff like that. But we, we do not really consider the idea of emptiness or, or of non-memory as an origin point. We, we look at this kind of psychoanalytic history as our a way, but not as real emptiness. So we have a focus only on, on one phase, the abiding phase, that is the phase of how do memories operate in the ordinary, everyday, visible world? How do we operate in that form? And this is where memory wrongly interpreted generates itself and proliferates right in this gap of only looking at the middle phase of the dis dissipative cycle. Because you neglect the uh, arising and dissolving, you begin to get an overbalance, and that's why it gets brittle. That's why it gets constipated, because the cycle is looked at in only, only one part of it. Okay, now the next thing that I would like to look at um, is the idea that one of the characteristics of the Kali Yuga Another one, besides this uh, temporal density, um, is the whole concept, uh, and this is something I've been developing from my doctoral thesis for years, but it progressively comes into more focus, is the idea of object proliferation. Object proliferation. Now, let me um, give you a brief history of objects to put you in the picture. The first man-made objects that we have are three million years old. These first objects are found in Africa, and they are very small. They are they are um, like hand axes and uh, pounding tools and th things like that, with a minimal of modification to them, very min minimally modified. And as an archaeologist, I happen to study this in great detail. Detail the kind of generation of tool making. And what progressively begins to happen after another million and a half years of no new and improved models, can you imagine, you know, uh, any 
car, the car industry with the same uh, models for a million and a half years. Um, what begins them, the first innovation is symmetry. That's the first innovation in tool making is the idea uh, of some degree of symmetry. And then you begin uh, to get into chipping and flaking uh, as sharpening and gradually uh, you finally begin it, be get into uh, uh, what we call microgeometry tools. You get into very, very small tools that are very precise and, and uh, the kind of uh, needlepoint stuff and very, very finely made things about 30,000, 40,000 years ago. And it's about uh, 30 or 40,000 years ago, uh, again, where um, you begin to generate the first symbolic objects. That's where you go from functional to symbolic objects. And when you make this leap, language is, you know, uh, afoot as soon as you be begin to get symbolic objects. And with symbolic objects and language, uh, everything begins to escalate because uh, in, the, in the scenario of objects, as it were, what begins to happen is roughly we have the Neolithic Revolution, which is about Oh, 9, 10,000 B.C. Some people put it a few thousand years earlier or later, but it's irrelevant. In the Neolithic Revolution, essentially, before we were hunter-gatherers, we were nomads. We followed herds uh, of different animals, the caribou and the deer and the bison and the mammoth. Uh, we followed the seasonal growth of plants to wherever they occurred. Uh, we followed nature, uh, and we did not own nature. Now, what gradually began to happen in the Neolithic Revolution, someone had a bright idea, and that is that we could domesticate crops and animals. We did not have to follow. We could take something and plant it. And with this planting, we could uh, stay in one place. We would not be at the kind of whims of this grand seasonal variation. And our animals, we could domesticate animals, that is to say, we did not have to go hunting all the time. We would take, we would begin to domesticate cows and uh, keep them in pens, and uh, sheep and goats and things like that would begin to occur. And, you know, it's a wonderful invention for many people, the idea of, of stopping this uh, nomadic life. Uh, others were not so sure that this was uh, a great idea because there was a great virtue in the nomadic life in many ways as well. But history rolled on and what began to happen is as you begin to settle and to nucleate, you began to um, generate objects for the first time in a different scale than just hand axes and cutting tools, just the bare essential tools. You began to make tools, uh, more permanent holding tools now. Instead of transporting water in ostrich eggs that were biodegradable in a very neat sense, you would begin to make longer lasting objects of clays and potteries. And in other words, the half-life of your objects would begin to increase. Uh, the idea of permanent objects instead of kind of a throwaway culture. Uh, began to accrete. And as these objects began to accrete, um, you began to uh, gradually through the years to make decorations on them and art on the objects. And this made the objects um, uh, more valuable, quote unquote, whatever that meant at the time. And uh, these objects had the very strange effect on people's minds as they acted like um, an attractor matrix for the human mind on which to see uh, even further possibilities for the proliferation of even more objects. <clears throat> that is to say, once you made a bowl, well, we can make a better bowl, and a bowl with a spout, and then a bowl with a this on it, and one with greater capacity, and then so on and so forth. Object proliferation began to form, it began to be a mirror to which the mind could say, well, we've done this, but we can do this better. Before you extracted from nature, now you were on this kind of reflection process. So that was one dynamic that began to occur, object proliferation and the generation of even more objects. Now, 
Um, I should say at a, a, a footnote right now, uh, before I go on with the scenario, the average home, the average home has in it today 300,000 objects in it. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And that means that you have to deal with the, ide the location and function and care of all these objects. So therefore, a lot of your mental activity is tied into this object array environment. Okay? Now, what happens, let's go back to the Neolithic for a moment. You see, then we have very few objects. It's gone from a few pots and bowls and a few digging sticks and spears and what have you and, and, and furs and beads and things like that to 300,000. I mean, the, you, the proliferation that has to go with that you see, the concomitant proliferation is, is the secret of this process is when you begin to generate objects, you have to have a concomitant and corresponding memory for every object that you own, whether it's online or not. It is. <laughs> the point is that we don't keep the 300,000 memory uh, online all the time. It's, um, we chunk things. We say it's in the garage, it's in the bedroom, it's in the den, it's in the kitchen. We have a chunking by, by spatial kind of labeling. But on the whole, uh, what happens is as soon as you have an object, you have to have a memory of that object. Otherwise, the object is, is useless to you. You don't, you don't know where you put it and therefore you can't use it. So you have to have some corresponding memory. Now, in terms of ownership, what begins to happen is very interesting. As soon as you begin to have this object proliferation, you begin to have to have the generation of a noun, a linguistic noun has to come into being for the generation of that object. This is a spear thrower. This is, you know, my uh, uh, water bowl. This is, uh, this is my fur to keep me uh, warm. This is uh, my uh, talisman, whatever it is. You have to have a corresponding noun for every object that is generated. Uh, now, with this kind of generation of noun, the converse of this, the most curious thing begins to happen is, is, is the generation of pronouns. N begins to occur. This is my object. This is your object. This is his object. This is their object. When you were in nature, there was no pronouns. There was just this vast, undifferentiated participation mystique. No differentiation of subject and object. Therefore, no pronoun. So pronouns are generated from nouns. And nouns are generated from objects. So you get this linguistic matrix beginning to occur. And it occurs in this kind of unconscious proliferation. Again, language is virus. Now, uh, what begins to happen is, again, the, the possibility of um, runaway systems. And as uh, Morris Berman, a cultural historian, uh, pointed out recently, you begin to get what we, he calls commodity fetish, fetishism. The idea that in the old days when objects, for example, certain totemic things in the Indian Northwest were made, they were meant to degenerate with weather after they were uh, made. They were the masks and the, and the things like that were left to weather and disintegrate, to dissolve in the dissipative cycle back into nature. They arise, they abided, and they dissolve. They were not kept as objects of art, you see. What we have done is taken these objects and got into the abiding phase, memory wrongly interpreted, and we fixate there. And we, we keep that going. So you get this very kind of um, uh, interesting uh, scenario uh, arising. Now, let's take a look at this in terms of the, the media, how this can be put to us in a very entertaining and uh, insightful way. Um, there was a film that was made, um, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago. Uh, something, I don't know, maybe it was more than that, ten years ago. Uh, called The Gods Must Be Crazy. How many of you saw this film? I figured a lot of you would. The, uh, I'll give you a brief recapitulation of this film because it's a wonderful teaching film. The, basically, the scenario happens, there's an airplane flying over Africa 
and two of the guys in it, one of them is drinking Coca-Cola, and he takes, finishes the bottle, and he throws it out of the plane. They're over the middle of nowhere. He throws it out, and it lands near a Bushman hunting party, as chance would have it. And the Bushmen then um, see th this bottle, and it is the introduction of a new and novel object into the culture. When this object comes in, first it is met with wonder and awe, and the multifarious uses of it are then discovered. First of all, you could uh, put things in it as a container that was very durable. It was a wonderful container for water. Second of all, you could roll things out like a, a roller. Uh, then you could blow in it and make wonderful sounds with it. Then you could, you know, all these objects were gener all these uses for the object were seen. But what began to happen is that everyone wanted to use it. All the pronoun thing began to arise as soon as this object was introduced. And what began to happen in this little world where there was peace and harmony was discord. Tremendous sense of discord. I want it. I want it. No. And fights began to break out over who was going to use this Coca-Cola bottle. Exactly. This Coca-Cola had occurred. So the thought was, and this is brilliant, they, the, the Bushman wisdom still prevailed. They thought, the gods must be crazy to have given us this object. It causes havoc in, in this society. So one of them was given the task to take this Coca-Cola Coca bottle to the edge of the world and get rid of it. Get this object out of here. We've got enough objects. That's essentially what they were saying. Okay, so in a microcosm in this film is this wonderful teaching about how uh, an object, a single object in this case, can take a very harmonically based uh, culture and throw it out the window. Uh, Jung said, um, uh, speaking of our current era, knowledge of the internal uh, world of the psyche was eclipsed by the external world of objects. The very same insight. The more we got hooked on objects, the more that we began to lose the uh, kind of internal world. Now, um, it's interesting that uh, in terms of uh, the, the very first writing ever discovered, it's a favorite uh, kind of point that come up archaeologically, uh, it's not some mystical writing about Mu or Lemuria or channeling or anything like that. The first writing ever discovered is, is a Sumerian tax receipt. Okay? It's 4500 B.C. and it's a tax receipt. Because what it is saying is, you have dealt with these objects and we want to keep a record of them so that we can uh, find out what, what the, tran the, as it were, the karmic trajectory of this object. Now, this is what begins to happen with objects. Record keeping grows as an industry. For all, you have to keep a memory for every object. Record keeping grows in proportion to object proliferation. Today, the biggest industry on the face of the earth is record keeping. That's what computers do more than anything else besides their creative uses. They do more than anything else is inventory. It's record keeping. And they're doing it. They're keeping track of objects and events con connected with objects. These, the transactions and interactions and transformations of objects. That's what is being kept records of. So record keeping grows out of this proliferation of this object array. So in a sense, you see, you get an extended mind, an unconscious extended mind is generated through this generation of objects. <laughs> and what it begins to, to generate then is the idea of um, shall we say, a left-brain memory. Now, a left-brain memory, you see, corresponds to the middle phase of the dissipative cycle. That is to say, uh, the abiding phase of memory. Memory in the world that we can see. And this, again, is the realm where, if you overload it, memory wrongly interpreted begins to proliferate. Now, let's take a little bit, a closer look at this idea of the... Um, uh, kind of the metaphysical arising of the way that we see the world. The density of objects, the density of objects in an environment creates a corresponding density of memory that you, through record keeping. And in turn, this density of memory generates the density of time. Temporal density is a function of memorial density. A memorial density is a function of object density. You will notice 
that those cultures that have the fewest objects live in the dream time. You look at the Australian Aborigines with their minimal object array and you see that they live in a completely different time frame. They live in a dream time, the Bushmen the same. As your uh, object density, uh, memorial density, temporal density occurs, it sets out this extended unconscious array of time. Time is generated and um, uh, this generation of, of, of time, the density of time, um, has a further uh, a aspect to it which is very interesting. Because of the uh, transactions and accounting for all these objects, the emphasis is, is placed on ever uh, on short-term memory because there are more objects and more transactions and interactions. Therefore, the short-term memory, where did I put this and what did I do with this and what happened here, because there are more things, your short-term memory has to be more active. And your short-term memory has to be more active uh, also in terms of crisis situations. Uh, whenever you have a potential crisis going on, which is now pretty much non-stop in, in the world at, at large. So, uh, the short-term memory has to keep track of everything. And again, the short-term memory takes place in this middle phase. Your short-term memory has to be more active uh, also in terms of crisis situations. Uh, whenever you have a potential crisis going on, which is now pretty much non-stop in, in the world uh, at large. So, uh, the short-term memory has to keep track of everything. And again, the short-term memory takes place in this middle phase of memory abiding, in this middle phase. And this means that memory arising and memory dissolving, this is right brain memory. This gets left out. And this means that far memory, memory of past lives, that's where the Schlitz ads comes in. You only go around once in life. Well, that's smack in the abiding phase of the dissipative cycle again, you see. Uh, if, you, if Object proliferation. Um, short-term memory in terms of, oh, I, I've looked at memory, I've read so much material on memory for the past ten years on, on the experimental psychology aspect of memory, just to see what's in these people's minds. They're looking at ever, at smaller and smaller increments of memory. Short-term memory is like really where it's at in, for many people. Uh, Short-term memory is like a paradigm in itself. There, there's a, it, it's like corresponding to the search for uh, the atom as the lowest common denominator in the physical world, short-term memory is the lowest common denominator in the memorial world. You, you look for the, the accuracy and the way that short-term memory um, uh, works as a, as a kind of a hypothesis that contributes to reality. Now, I should say as a footnote to that, the idea of what is known in, in the memory trait as STML, short-term memory loss, which is uh, the one of the signal uh, attributes of altered state. Uh, this is one of the first thing that happens to memory is short-term memory loss. Now, many people in the uh, investigation of memory look at sh uh, the, the the real traditionalists in memory research look at short-term memory loss as pathological. You lose your short your mind. You're losing your mind if you lose your short-term memory. Watch out. Keep control. Stay in the abiding phase where it's safe. Let's ac accumulate some, let's stay in control. It's all that kind of thing. Don't let go. Whatever you do, don't let go of your memory or you will just melt. You'll evaporate. But the real secret is, is that the, that's the ploy. Stay with memory because memory is control. The point, that's how the CIA looks at it and all intelligence agencies, they look at memory as control. But the fact, the secret is of the perennial philosophies that if you die to yourself, that if you unknow, learn the art of unknowing, that if you learn the art in, in Tibetan, which is called Tramme, which is non-memory, what happens then is that you do not lose your mind. Actually, you come into what Joe was talking about yesterday, primordial mind or nature of mind. This is, has no pronouns, you see. This has no hooks of personality to it. So. 
memory is used as a control device. That's why when you take classes at school, you're asked to regurgitate in, in early school rote mnemonic. Because see, this is a way of hooking you into control and predictability. It's kind of, give me back what I gave you now. Give that right back. No, nothing new. Just give that right back to me. This is, you get the highest marks on your test for regurgitation. So the idea of, of short-term memory loss as a, um, as a gateway, it is actually a gateway into a different dimension, the dimension of God, the dimension of the overmind, of the overself, whatever you want to call it, Atman, Brahman, it doesn't matter, it's different spelling for the same phenomena. The same phenomena is primordial mind. It, it really doesn't matter what you call it. But if you control short-term memory as a kind of a sphincter and you don't let anyone through that or yourself through it, you're locked in this abiding phase. When you go into the, through the rabbit hole, as it were, of short-term memory, through short-term memory loss, but you've got to go through it with awareness. If you go through it unconscious, unconscious, you're finished. I mean, you're, 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 you're drunk, you're stoned, you can kill yourself in, in that form. You have no awareness, you have no clarity. But if you go through with awareness or clarity, that is the entrance to, um, uh, as I say, uh, the two phases of the dissipative cycle that are neglected, the arising and the dissolving aspects. You begin to see the entire dissipative nature of the mind. Now, one other thing about the uh, objects here is that um, if you get, stay on the object level, of, you see objects fixate attention. They fixate attention and they generate kind of reactive automatic mind that is memory wrongly interpreted so you fixate or you crystallize attention through your objects this is my mercedes and i'm going to put a uh, i'm going to put a, an alarm system on it no one's going to get this and uh, i i ha people begin to to build up a paranoia about their valuable objects you see they become object hooked in that sense um one, uh, uh, another aspect of this in, in terms of uh, our particular time is that people tend to get into hoarding this time uh, in this age that we live. These 300,000 objects, we, we have become temporal pack rats uh, in a sense. We are hoarding all these objects in a sense. We don't need all these objects, you know, all these 300,000 objects. We hoard them and one of the reasons that we hoard them from a psychoanalytic point of view is that we think that we, that these will be a buffer between us and death, between us and extinction. Uh, that if we hoard things, that they uh, are a substitute for living time, these objects. And um, compulsive hoarding, and also a lot of people hoard when they get older, uh, actually is a representative of trying to stave off death. The, the people who are very rich often accumulate tremendous arrays of things, not just for pleasure, but to actually keep the idea of extinction at bay. Um, now, if we look at um, uh, objects uh, from another point of view, um, that is to say, uh, from the... Uh, one point is, shall we say, the participation, uh, um, uh, the mystical participation, that is to say, when there's no difference between subject and object, in primitive societies, uh, participation mystique, versus um, the idea of the Buddhist uh, or tantric teachings of detachment from objects. And I want to go into that for a moment. We have a very interesting kind of what Ken Wilber calls the pre-trans fallacy. You begin to separate two things which look the same, but they're really not. Uh, in, in the participation mystique, there's a kind of fusion of subject and object. In the Zen tradition, in the Eastern uh, kind of sense, you are taught to detach yourself from objects, not, not buying their whole, seeing them as they are, but not becoming totally involved with them. And there's a subtle difference in this. Uh, uh, as Hui Neng, the sixth uh, patriarch, Zen patriarch, said, not to be defiled by external objects. This is to be one with the unconscious, and that's capital U. It's, it's conscious, unconscious, he means there. That is to be deta detached from objects so they are present in consciousness. When all thoughts are discarded, consciousness is cleared off from all its de defilements. So, 
on one hand you have this fusion of subject and object, on the other one you have the detachment like this, not getting attached to objects. Okay? Now, there are some similarities between these two states. In the participation mystique, you may not become attached, but you don't consciously become detached. There's a subtle difference. Now, if we go on with this a little bit, it becomes interesting because what um, uh, Jung refers to is this, uh, or, or in the Zen tradition, this epistemological uh, detachment. The translation for it of, of Hui Meng, uh, of this unconscious, is the, the word Wu Nian. And Wu means no, and Nian means literally, it has several uh, nuances to it. It means no, it means no memory or no habit patterns. It's most traditionally translated as no memory. So Wu Nian means no memory. Now, in other words, unconscious with a capital U or, unconsci or conscious unconscious means a state of no memory. But what this no memory is, and it's very important, is that it is a temporary suspension. It is not an obliteration of memory, non-memory. Non-memory is, is what Lung Changpa, one of the great uh, masters of Tibetan uh, uh, Vajrayana thought, uh, said the spontaneous wizardry of the mind takes place uh, out of emptiness or out of non-memory, the spontaneous wizardry. And again, the obvious, by the very terms that he uses, akin to shamanism, right there with the term wizardry. Um, Non-memory is something that, you see, a computer is very interesting. A computer cannot unknow. This is a very important thing. It cannot go into the unknowing mode. It can, if you clear a computer's uh, memory, it's no temporary suspension. You, you're, that's it. The little I know about computers, if you wipe the disk clean, that's it. Uh, you, you don't just say, okay, forget this, and then see what happens. This is a uniquely human function, the ability to suspend uh, and then see what happens. Now, um, non-memory, you see, is it teaches us the... It shouldn't be cultivated uh, for itself. It should be cultivated in conjunction with memory. That is to say, if you, just because you've given up the, the abiding cycle and looked at the dissolve, arising and dissolving, that's to substitute one thing for another. You need the whole cycle. The middle phase is conservation of memory. The others are the arising and dissolution of memory. So, for memory to be its, mo its highest form, you have to have conservation and dissolution. You need the dance between non-memory and memory. It's like saying the left brain is bad. That's ridiculous. The left brain has a vital function. It's what enables us to communicate and to exist in this world in many ways and to make advances. But it's where we become fixated at one aspect of the dissipative cycle that amnesia sets in and then a runaway system begins and we go out of control. That's the dynamic of it. So uh, this non-memory, we have to learn how to look at it to oscillate it um, and in sitting practice, one of the most valuable things uh, that I have learned in, from my altered states is the oscillation of memory and non-memory, the oscillation of attention and the release of attention. And realizing, and I always see them in, a, in an infinity cycle. I always see them in this form like this. I don't know why, my mind always takes it to this just this dance like this, because it moves to like memory and then just, and it shifts the dissipative cycle and it shifts and it shifts. And this figure eight, actually, that it uh, occurs, eight is, is called the Lemnus gate in uh, mathematics. And uh, eight actually is very interesting. This is a footnote. Eight is the number of Isis, the goddess. And eight, uh, the, the goddess is the, the, the great, as it were, the primordial mind. Um, the last thing about objects that I would like to introduce now is that, again, objects in themselves are not negative at all. It is our reference to them that it is this unconscious mental mass, this linguistic flux, invisible flux that makes them what they are or aren't. You see, because there's a tremendous tradition in my research and memory, I was astonished to find, I looked under the folk tales concerned with memory, there is a tremendous array of folktales concerned with magical objects 
that restore memory. There is the magical stone, the magical drink, the magical feather, the magical flower, the magical kiss, the magical, you know, footstool. There are, there are things which actually are encoded as awakeners in the environment. And this idea of awakening in the environment is a very interesting one. Uh, what it pertains to is the idea of the conscious impregnation uh, uh, of the environment, of mind, specifically to awaken people in, in future states when they go by or interact with this object. And to use Rupert's framework, this is the setting up of a morphic framework around an object. If you take an object and you sit with it and you meditate it and you sleep with it and you dream with it and you use it in ritual, it begins to absorb. In psychometry we see that these vibrations are absorbed. Every object we have absorbs some of our field. That's why a psychometrist can take a ring or a belt in a very unusual way. One of the ways this is done, in the, for example, in the Gurdjieff tradition, is um, you take um, a place or an object, and a good thing that I use in many of the classes that I've taught is you take a doorway and you say to your class or those that people that you're dealing with, every time you pass this doorway, you should wake up, be mindful. It's like the bell going off in, in, the, in the retreat, the meditation retreat. Every time you pass the doorway, you have a microsecond of increased awareness to that you are part of this universal flux and that you are not just an ego, or any way you want to encode it, but a moment of heightened awareness when you pass this object. Then the art becomes to impregnate an environment with conscious objects. And then, you be, as you begin to impregnate your environment, you begin to set up an extended mind field in the environment which you react with when you go out into it. And this is why, for the American Indian and the Dallas and all the other Aboriginal peoples, that their environment was a conscious environment, that Gaia was alive, and that when you went out, you didn't just see, you remembered. That's what the dream time was about. All these ancestors, the rainbow serpents and, and the the great whales and all the totemic beings, you, you were reminded that you were part of this dream time, of Gaia, of this living entity. Anyhow, let's uh, stop here. I've got uh, another subject. Let's break for about, you know, ten minutes, but don't wander too far because I want to keep the rhythm and uh, we'll continue. Uh, part two, um, meanwhile back at the source. Um, I want to go on to a, another subject, uh, a very uh, valuable one that uh, we should look at, and that is one of the counters to the state of kind of waking sleep or this runaway system, this memory wrongly interpreted. One of the principal counters to it is to develop something called cross-state retention. Cross-state retention. I've talked about this before, but I've done a lot of thinking about it uh, kind of since that time. Now, cross-state retention, or CSR, is um, based on the idea that most of the time when we are in an altered state, uh, whether it's uh, psychomimetically induced or dream or emotional, when we go back to an ordinary state, we don't remember. There's a veil of forgetting between going from state to state. This is, Roland Fisher calls it state-bound experience in, in classical memory uh, parlance. It, it's called state-specific memory. That is to say, uh, if you're one of the classic things, for example, in, in Sufi story is uh, Nasruddin, uh, he loses his key and uh, while well, he's drunk, wakes up the next morning, can't find it, and he says, what am I going to do? And he says, well, I'll get drunk again. And he stumbles off into the bushes again and finds the key because he's in the same state. This is just a, a, an example by parable of the way that it works. Um, now, again, in the dissipative cycle, the abiding section, the center one, there's the arising, abiding, and dissolving. In the abiding cycle, that's where uh, state-specific memory uh, in current research is focused, in this area right here. You don't cross states. You don't look at the transition between arising and abiding and between abiding and dissolving and between dissolving and arising. You don't look at the transitions, you see, in contemporary memory research. You only look at this abiding phase. 
and some psychoanalytical history of early childhood. Now, um, cross-state retention, as most of us know, when we, have, when we have dreams, unless it is an exceptionally vivid dream, when we wake up, we know that we have dreamed, but the dream disappears like the bubbles of a wave going out after they just go pop, 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 and it dissolves because it's like a different dimension. There are yogas of dream recall taught in the Tibetan tradition. There are yogas taught in African systems of shamanism that I know of for uh, dream recall. Uh, there are many aspects of cross-state retention taught in many different uh, esoteric traditions. In fact, I would say that cross-state retention is the essence of all um, shamanic and uh, uh, esoteric ways of thinking uh, at heart. For example, uh, Eliade teaches that the shaman is the man who goes into the other realms, or the woman who goes into other realms, but he is able to bring it back. You see, this is what differentiates him from other beings. He's able to bring it back. Many people have altered state experiences, and they're, wow, wow, next morning, well, I really can't elaborate on quite what happened, but I know it was fantastic. It's what we call the limbic system flash. You know that it happened, and you, had a, you have a rush, but you can't elaborate it. Now, the idea of uh, cross-state retention, first of all, is never taught to us in school. I want to bring this to a basic, everyday life. We're never taught any idea of cross-state retention. You're taught state-specific, regurgitative memory. You are not taught the idea of remembering from one. You're not even taught that you got other states, let alone remembering between them. Now, um, the idea of uh, this kind of shamanic sense uh, can be taught in many different ways. Uh, it can be taught uh, in, for example, the idea of what is called holy reversals is one way in which cross-state retention is, is taught. For example, in the peyote ceremonies, when the uh, huichols go to the highlands, the, is it pronounced Wirakuta? When, it, when they go, there's a certain point in distance where the, everything must be reversed in terms of language and act and symbol. If you are right-handed, you do everything with the left hand. If, you, if this is your friend, you refer to him as your enemy. If you're walking along and it's a beautiful sunny day, you'll say, gee, isn't the moon lovely tonight? The, the reversals are a way of jarring the attention from fixated patterns. And this inculcates an unusual quality to the, the attention so that it is remembered differently because of the reversal. So the, this quality of reversal is done in, uh, in, in, in many different tra traditions throughout the world. That's just one in particular. Uh, in fact, I, re I recall one that um, uh, Rupert told me about once, and that is the tradition of holy uh, in India. Uh, isn't there a reversal between master and servant? Yes. That's rather interesting. Mm. Uh, and I think this probably uh, arose not from just kind of sense, uh, some sense of e e equality, uh, but from some sense of, of awakening. The name itself might have something uh, to do with that. Um, now, if we look at another aspect of this uh, cross-state uh, cross retention, to, it oper to operate it fully, it requires a notion of the entire dissipative cycle, how things arise, how they abide, and how they disappear. And, and, and a knowledge also that there is always, no matter what phase you're in, that uh, apparently that, there, that primordial mind is there, no matter what phase is, is showing its face, whether it's the abiding phase or the dissolving or the uh, arising. The primordial sense is always there. And if you have that sense, the idea of cross-state retention is uh, vastly um, made much more easy. But in, ter but in practical terms, really, let's get you know, non-theoretical from practical terms, the best way for cross-state retention to work is the following. You see, attention in the modern world, because of all the objects that we've got in it, attention slides across the surface of the mind of objects. It just slides. We never go in deep. It slides across the surface of the world. Now, um, how do we counter that? Well, for one of the ways in the traditional schools, like in the Gurdjieff tradition, that is done, there's a tradition called self-remembering. And self-remembering literally means that 
you, just like in mindfulness, you take a moment, any moment, you take this moment, for example, and you make it special by investing it with an inordinate amount of intention. And you see, th just in a, a footnote to this explanation, the, the, the sequence goes intention, attention, retention. If your intention, if your will is clear that you want to remember, you will pay attention and therefore your retention will be clear. Intention, attention, retention. That's how it works. Now, if you want to raise consciousness by this cross-state uh, retention manner, you take a moment, and it can be any moment, and you encode your, all of your five senses response to that moment. In other words, you take one minute, like right now, you take a minute, and first of all, you look around you, and you don't try to encode everything. This is something I've learned. You look at a number of key objects, three, four, five. The mind can only chunk five plus or, uh, seven plus or minus two uh, objects at a time. So don't try to chunk, say, more than five to nine objects. You look around, say, at people. You, you see what they're wearing, just generally. Then you look at your, um, what you're sitting on, and you feel it, and you see what is this texture feeling, like so. And then you do your smell, like I can smell tiger lily over here. And uh, then uh, you can look into the sense of taste, what kind of taste in your mouth, perhaps from breakfast or the coffee that you've, you're just drinking or whatever it is. And what, hear, what you stop for a moment and you hear, you hear the flies, you hear the birds, you hear the sound, between, you encode that. And you begin to multi-sensory encode over a one-minute period. And the way that it works in the phone, you begin to encode all of those things. And the way that it works is the more things that you can encode a memory in sensorially, the easier it will be to recall the entire memory. That's really it in a nutshell. So if you're able to have in these five sensory modes, it's very different than if you only, if you just saw someone, you only have a visual sensory mode to recall from. But you see, the senses reinforce each other. And if you can reinforce them by your attention, you're set. Now, after the ten years I've been working on my memory thesis, I can put it down to a nutshell what it's all about. Memory is a function of attention. That's it. It's the whole thing. It's the name of the game. If you don't pay attention, you don't remember. It's that simple. It's that simple. And, of course, if you don't have an intention, you don't have an attention. So it's that intention, attention, retention is the, is the memorial cycle. So what we do is we take that minute, and you have to know how to trigger yourself uh, in that moment. I usually, when I, I give classes or something, uh, do it in a way which is... Uh, uh, do you want to uh, say something? Okay. Uh, the, the sense of um, uh, encoding is uh, done by like a theme. For example, the theme of water is given. I'll say uh, to a class, we're going to meet uh, next Thursday, but next uh, Tuesday, uh, I would like you, or, or any time before that, any, any time that you see water in any form, be it rain or washing up liquid or flushing the toilet or taking a bath, any time you see water, I wanted to remind you to take a moment one moment and stretch it out and do that multi-sensory sensing. And then I'm going to ask you all to tell your story of that moment. I have them all tell stories. And of all these moments, and you get these, and see, what I'm about is, is slices of life. Every moment is special. But it's only special because of the attention invested in it. And uh, I've had them, I mean, these housewives, uh, I taught adult education in England for a while, and these housewives had said, well, I was washing the dishes and I remember the water and I looked around and there was the full moon and she just got excited and, you know, and, and then uh, my husband came home and the dog barked and, you know, and, and this, thing, this little old moment became special. And many people did this. We did this with all kinds of things. All I'm saying is that this cross state retention is developed by multi-sensorial attention uh, within, say, a minute's framework. And you have to be able to trigger yourself. The point is we're too lazy. We walk through the world and we go like this, but we never just go like that. That is to say, you're walking by uh, a beautiful flower. I mean, I do this all the time. And all of a sudden, it catches my attention, and I'll sit with it. I'll smell it, and I'll see the ground that is coming out. I'll, hear the, I'll let that be a cue. Anything can be a cue for you, and you go into that mode. Um, now, 
One of the other things about uh, cross-state retention that uh, I'd like to say, and this really relates to the uh, theme of um, the extended mind, is the idea, first of all, the, just the idea of cross-state involves extension right uh, in itself, right to begin with. The idea, there are two types of cross-state retention that I'd like to look at. And one of them is, um, it's purely associative, like this, like, like this idea reminds me of this idea, reminds me of this idea, and it's this kind of glass bead game type of thinking, okay? And that is one type of cross-state retention uh, goes autocatalytic after all. It begins to breed more and more insights. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's like the opposite of memory wrongly interpreted. It's like mem memory rightly interpreted when it goes cross-state. Now, the other aspect of it is a Greek term called anamnesis. A-N-A-M-N-E-S-I-S, -S, anamnesis, or an, any way you want to pronounce it. But anyhow, what it, it, anamnesis has, t uh, again, two meanings to it. In the classical Greek sense, it means to be able to remember your karmic trajectory, as it were, your past lives back, like Pythagoras could remember when he was a butcher and a candlestick maker and a this and a that. He, Pythagoras was known for his ability to trace his karmic trajectory back, and this is uh, the, the idea of anamnesis. It is used today in psychoanalysis when talking about the patient's past history. They, they talk about a, a patient's kind of psychoanalytic anamnesis, tell me about your early childhood, that type of thing. But, um, you see, at a certain point, uh, anamnesis, just going back with, I, I was a dishwasher and I was a princess and I was a channeler or whatever, an ice skater, it, this goes back and back and back. And it, after a while, see, Buddha's first realization, his, as it were, his parinirvana beneath the bow tree, when, when he became enlightened, it began when he started going back in his karmic trajectory. He went back 500 lives. And he was a this, and a king, and a queen, and a this, and a this, and he was cruel, and he was happy, and he was delightful, and he was sad. And, but what he saw in his great genius was not the fact that he could go back life to life to life to life to life, as it were. What he saw is that every one of these lives was, in a sense, an illusory pearl on the necklace of primordial mind. That is, every one of these lives, although appearing separate, 